I'm Dave Milligan. I'm chair of the Michigan Wheat Program. It's certainly nice to see you all out this morning and welcome you to the annual meeting. Certainly uh, want to thank the people here at the Saginaw Valley Research Farm for hosting this today. We certainly uh, wanted to take advantage of this fine facility that's been here to just new and to serve agriculture. So anyway, with, uh, if you don't know it already, uh, over here and when you go out and over here in the corners, the restrooms down that hallway. And if you, hopefully you've all had a chance to see the vendors. There's, they're out in this hallway and they're out in the foyer. There'll be a break later. And, There'll be a break at noon too, so certainly take the opportunity to talk to the sponsors and visit and visit with them, and we certainly appreciate them being here and helping support the wheat industry. But without further ado, we'll get the program started, and first we have the Michigan wheat breeder, Eric Olson, and talk about what he has new, and as you will certainly find out, Eric's been very busy and hopefully has some new exciting things for us. So with that, Eric. All right. So my name is Eric Olson. I'm a wheat breeder and geneticist at Michigan State University. And I work on developing uh, new wheat varieties for Michigan and the Great Lakes region. So I'd like to start off by thanking, thanking you all for coming today and thanking you for the support for the program that we've received over the years. So I, I will note that in the United States, over half of the wheat varieties that are planted on, uh, well, I don't know what the acreage is, we're at 510,000 this year in Michigan. Half of those varieties are produced by public breeding programs. So, so we're, not, we're not produced by large multi, the wheat varieties aren't all produced by large multi-billion dollar ag companies like corn and soys are. So these are uh, largely produced with grower, by grower funded uh, and locally funded breeding programs. So I'd like to thank all the uh, supporters within the state of Michigan here. Uh, USDA and the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. And I'd also like to, to uh, point out the folks that are helping to, to do this work. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes into this. You know, we're in the field uh, at the same time that you all are during the wheat season, but we're working year-round, too. So Dennis Pennington is helping us with uh, the commercial yield testing now. It's been great working with Dennis. Uh, Amanda Noble is an assistant, plant, uh, assistant wheat breeder in the program. Um, she handles a lot of the... the um, logistics in the program and Sam Martin he's out uh, spreading fertilizer today on our yield trials um, and Tommy Reck and John Turkus are grad students in the program they're future plant breeders so just want to acknowledge the folks that make it all happen so you guys this should be a pretty familiar uh, figure for you guys we see yield increases in Michigan this is our overall state average yield we're just looking at a snapshot from 97 up to 2018. And you can see a pretty linear trend. We're looking at about a bushel to a bushel and a half increase every year. That was kind of a nice spike that we had in 2016 right there. But we have a pretty linear increase. And a lot of that, these increases are due, um, the fluctuations are largely due to weather. But I would attribute these increases to improved genetics, improved varieties that are available to growers, um, improved agronomic practices, the adoption of um, an application of, of nitrogen, adoption of fungicide applications to control scab, but we're on, we're on track to keep increasing yields. Varieties are a, pretty, a very important part of that. Now, how many folks have farmed with a John Deere bee? How many folks have a bee at home? Quite a few of you. My grandpa Lai has a, a John Deere B. My, my grandpa Olson, his first tractor was an 801 Powermaster, a Ford actually. We were a Ford family growing up in Wisconsin. But you can see the, far, the tractors on your farm, the technology on your farm has improved. It's changed over time, right? You might run an auger with your 5020, but I don't think you're going to be pulling your tillage equipment or your planter with a 5020 right now. And technology has advanced. I think this was a big jump going from Armstrong power steering to, power, to having power steering, right? That's a, that's a technology advancement, right? And now we're planting with, with precision, uh, GPS, trigger planting, and, and so there's been rapid advancements in varieties. My point is, varieties are advancing as well, and, and they are a technology, right? So what I would like to show you here is it follows the same linear trend, same increase. This is the uh, Michigan commercial variety trial that we've done for decades now from 1997 through 2018, you can see there's been an increase. Here's that spike here. 
I'm showing here, this is the overall average, right? Just in, it's increasing on average, there's fluctuation, right? Weather can, can drive a lot. But what I'm showing up here, this is the average, this is the highest yielding variety that year. On average, the highest yielding variety yields 10 bushels higher than the average, right? You don't want to be planting an average variety on your farm. There, and so, what, so there is opportunity to increase yield potential through variety selection. Investigating these, the data that we generate from these trials and finding those varieties that perform well and have the traits that are important on your farm, disease resistance traits, protection from stripe rust, and control for scab. These are, important, these are important technologies that are being incorporated into the new varieties that are available for you. So think about that, adding an extra 10 bushels per acre on your farm. That translates into profitability. And that's why I get excited about genetics and breeding is because there's a lot of opportunity to increase yields. Now it's a long process. It's a long evolved process here. It starts with crossing in the greenhouse. We make about 500 crosses in the greenhouse. Um, and I'll emphasize that the greenhouse is an important place for us. We, we run about 5,000 one-gallon pots through there. We have a, we have a large-scale grow operation to produce, um, to make the crosses and then produce all of these populations. Oh, I got, got crunched a little there. But right now we have 144,000 F2 plants, planted uh, eight plants every square inch um, to advance our populations. We're, we don't have the resources to do large-scale double haploid production, but we have, we have a few tricks up our sleeves. To, to move these populations forward. And then by year three and four, we're making selections. So this is our, our head row nursery. There are 8,000 potential new genotypes, new potential new varieties in the field. And we're using genomic technologies, genomic selection, to identify those lines early that have yield, high yield potential and have the traits that we're interested in. A lot of molecular markers out there tag, that can tag these traits. And then we move those predicted lines into yield testing. And then after a few years, we find those lines that are, that are elite, and those go to foundation and certified seed testing. So we're looking at about an eight-year process here, and we're starting this process over every single year, we're making new crosses every year. So hopefully I'll be able to turn this crank four or five times in my career here at MSU. Now, I'd like to talk today about those varieties that are available to you uh, in the, in the very near future, either for fall planting this year in 2019 or next year in 2020. So the first variety I'd like to talk about is a, a soft white winter wheat. So how many, how many white wheat growers do we have in the room today? Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is, this is a good talk for you guys. So talk about two white wheat varieties. Any red wheat growers in here too? Okay, good deal. We've got a good mix here. So there's a little something for everybody in this, in this talk today. Hold the mic a little closer. Okay. All right. That's better. Okay. So whitetail. That's our first, that's the, the first variety that I've actually released uh, that, that came out of selections that I made when I started here at MSU. So it's a, it's a soft white winter wheat. It's a cross. It's got two familiar parents, Ambassador and Jupiter. So these are two fairly well-known uh, soft white winter wheats. And th the point of the breeding program is to cross the best and find something better. So what we found with whitetail, it's the highest yielding uh, in our commercial variety trials, it's been the highest yielding soft white winter wheat for two years now, two years in a row. You know, you get, you get one year of good data, sometimes they'll break your heart, right? Well, you've got to have multiple years of testing on these lines. So we're seeing very good adaptation across Michigan environments, very short plant architecture. So this is, uh, those of you familiar with Jupiter, it's, it's as short as Jupiter. So you can really push this variety, right? Good, good short, thick straw. So this is a variety that you can manage intensively. And we're seeing lower dawn. In over, over two years of testing for mycotoxin is very low don. So you'll see that it doesn't get infected as, as bad as its parents for scab. And of course, milling and baking quality. There's, what I like about Michigan is that, especially with soft white wheat, almost every single bushel of soft white wheat produced in Michigan is milled in the state of Michigan and turned into products within the state of Michigan. So it's pretty extraordinary. Um, the same with red wheat. It's all it's all, it's all uh, pr anything produced in our state is, is milled, uh, if not in Michigan, in Toledo, right? So it's a very, very tight-knit um, uh, from growers to, uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to products here in Michigan. Now, the data. This is, where, this is where I spend most of my time is with the data. And we can see whitetail 
has, has a solid bushel, a bushel and a half advantage over Jupiter um, in commercial trials here. And so we see our, um, these are some, some lines. We use these as checks in our nursery, right? We, we always test against the best. So we're looking at our Dynagro. This is our go-to line for, for yield potential and for scab resistance. So um, don't misinterpret this as these are bad varieties. I'm just, I'm just demonstrating areas where whitetail does excel, right? So Ambassador uh, is another check in the program. Now keep W190 in mind. This is an experimental line um, that we, we're still testing in the program. And here's Jupiter, good old Jupiter. Now, what's important to note here a flowering date is very important. I'll talk a little bit more about this um, a little bit later. But you can see whitetail is flowering similar to Jupiter. These are important considerations when selecting varieties. Believe it or not, wheat varieties flower on different days. If you had a field of ambassador on one side of the road and whitetail on the other side of the road, the ambassador field would flower two days earlier, at least two days earlier, right? And what does that have implications for? Spraying for scab, right? That's, that's a critical management timing, is that flowering. So it's important to consider the flowering date of these varieties because it will affect when you make those management applications. And, and plant height has implications in, in management decisions as well. Right? A shorter plant, if you're, if you're looking at high-end yield and you're considering investment in a plant growth regulator, you won't get as much out of that investment from a shorter plant architecture. 30 inches is a pretty short plant, short and stocky, right? So some of these are a little bit longer legged. If you're going to invest in a growth regulator, it's going to be in those, those taller genotypes that are, going, that are longer legged plants that are going to respond a little better to that management input. So that's whitetail. This is available uh, for plant on a, on a, on a modest scale uh, for, for planting this year in 2019 if you're interested in this variety. So this is a release through Michigan Crop Improvement Association. Now, shifting gears a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about two other varieties. These are just numbers right now. These are, these are showing promise, and we do have the foundation seed on increase for these varieties. They're not yet available. They'll be ready in 2020. But uh, W1039 is another white wheat, uh, same, same, uh, a similar pedigree, ambassador by D6234. So again, we're crossing good by good and coming up with a little bit better here. Uh, very high yield potential. And now this variety flowers very early. So, so you'll see this, uh, there's a, a, a stark contrast. Um, it's a very early flowering. And as, it, flowering marks the start of grain fill, right? So as we know, an extra two or three days of grain fill can buy you bushels, right? Especially towards the end of the season, where, where wheat tends to pick up steam later in the season. Lower FHB risk for this variety as well. And again, uh, this should be available not this year, but next year for, for planting. Now this is the difference in flowering that I was pointing out. W1039 flowers significantly earlier than, than well, whitetail's a little bit later than Jupiter is kind of our, our late maturity check here. And you see Dynagro is, is not as late as, as Jupiter. You can think about this as um, uh, Memorial Day weekend is when, or around mid-Michigan, when we usually see flowering in our nurseries. So I'm always out, I don't really take a, any breaks over Memorial Day, I'm always rating flowering. But you can, you can consider this uh, W1039 is flowering like on Friday of Memorial Day weekend, and then Jupiter's following the flowering the following Monday or Tuesday then, right? There's a few days separation in flowering for those varieties. And of course, the, the most important column here is yield potential, right? W1039 is actually just a little bit better uh, than our newest release, Whitetail, right? That's kind of the point, right? We are, we're ratcheting up yield potential year after year with these new varieties. Now why is flowering important? Right, we can, cause if you have, let's look at, consider four different flowering dates. Right, two varieties, one flowering very early, 148 days, a late flowering variety, 151 days. And there's always a risk for fusarium around flowering, right? We don't really know what weather's gonna be like in the middle of May, towards the end of May here. If you have one variety, one early flowering variety planted, and you have a rain event where you can't spray, right? We all know, we, I'm, I'm sure folks in this room know what it's like to drive past in the pickup and know that you can't spray that field today. That if, that, if you have one variety on all your acres, that one variety is at risk. If you split maturities, 
you have two varieties, and if you're planting 50-50 or 75-25, there's still a portion that has not flowered yet and is not experiencing the same risk as that early flowering variety. Right? So splitting varieties can help you spread your risk. Now, when we talk about scab, it's always about the risk of scab, right? Uh, dockages and so on. There, there are insurance policies for fusarium out there. And genetics is, is the best investment in insurance for scab. We have a lot of diversity in, in terms of how, what, kind, what level of resistance we have in the varieties. Right? So we can see some of the most resistant lines out there. These are all white wheat here for, in this example. We've got our 9242 that I mentioned. And our experimental line, W190 here, doesn't get much scab. Right? So this is on a, on a 0 to 100 scale. A low number is good when we're talking scab. So you can see these are lower on, on the lower end of the spectrum here. A white tail and W1039, they're kind of in the middle. I, I would in no way say these are moderately resistant. I would say they're less susceptible than some of their contemporaries. Right? White tail is less susceptible than its parents. Right? So Jupiter Ambassador, they, there is a risk present there. This new experimental, it may or may not be a variety. We'll, we'll see how it performs again this year. Uh, you can see that whitetail is a lower risk, and W1039 are a little bit lower risk for scab. What, what, what can that affect, right? What can fusarium affect? Can, sure, sure can affect yield. You look at this, this is a yield chart going back to uh, 1960 to, uh, this is just up to 2017 here. Um, this dip exists on every, in every state in the Great Lakes region in Ontario, right? This is 96, this is one of the worst scab epidemics on record, right? That's what it did to the state average yield, right? Not to, not to mention the <laughs> locally on your farms, right? Now what, is that, what does scab look like in the field for a resistant versus a, moder versus a moderately resistant variety? Well, on the right hand, I, I apologize if this isn't the best image for you guys, but you can see if you look at Ambassador here, when you look at the severity within the spike, just about 80% of all the spikes are, are, are infected. Right? This is one of the most susceptible varieties out there. It's a risk. Contrast that with W190 here. You might see one or two of the individual spikelets infected. That's the power of resistance. Instead of colonizing the entire spike there and pumping up the mycotoxin, that, that fungus in the resistant varieties is walled off. It's restricted to, to, to one or two kernels per head, right? So you can, having a, it'll have a dramatic effect, right, in reduction of scab in the field. W1039 is kind of middle of the road there. It's not as bad as Ambassador, but it's not, not doesn't have the same level of resistance as the most resistant lines. I'd like to use W190 as one of my myth busters, too, that, that soft white wheat varieties are all susceptible to scab. They're not W190 is it's a white wheat and is the most resistant line that we have evaluated in, in the time that I've been at MSU. So, that, that, so you can find resistance in soft white wheat. Now the reason you should go for genetics, this is a little bit older data from 2012, but this is a meta-analysis from, from my extension colleagues that have evaluated uh, resistant, moderately resistant, susceptible, and moderately susceptible varieties with fungicides. This will show you the the interaction between variety and management, right? So this is telling us, this, is, this, this figure shows the percent control relative to the untreated susceptible check, right? So your susceptible here is your susceptible variety, no fungicides. Excuse me, with fungicides. Susceptible variety treated with a fungicide. And what you'll notice is the moderately resistant variety has better control. Just, based, just the genetics of the moderately resistant variety has better control than the susceptible plus the fungicide. But you know what's even better than a moderately resistant variety with no fungicide? A moderately resistant variety with fungicide, right? So you're getting the significantly higher control versus treating a susceptible variety, even a moderately susceptible variety treated with a fungicide. A moderately resistant variety treated with a fungicide is, provides the, hands down, the best control for scab and mitigates risk better than, better than um, just fungicide alone. Now, we have some great resources available to us. So you might, you might say, Dr. Olson, where, where, how do I know which varieties are resistant? How do I know which fungicides and what rate? The U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative has done a phenomenal job now of putting together um, 
a resource for that, ScabSmart. So if you go to scabsmart.org, you'll find a listing of the most resistant, the moderately resistant varieties, as well as the fungicides that are, that are available for, for scab control in Michigan. Both market classes, soft red and soft white winter wheats. And we also, we also have these data posted at varietytrials.msu.edu. That's our, that's our official variety trial for the state of Michigan. So I'm going to shift gears to red wheat, R1140. Very competitive grain yield. Now this has a, an excellent foliar disease resistance package. Resistance to stripe rust, leaf rust, it's got LR26 and powdery mildew resistance. And so what this is telling us is you, if, if, if your economics dictate that you can spray one fungicide, this is the variety, at, fungicide at flowering, this is a variety to consider. That foliar, that flag leaf disease package becomes critical if, you, if, if your economics dictate one fungicide application. And we also have very early flowering in this variety. I, I uh, you know, early, early coming, I, I, um, I did my PhD and, and some work at K-State, and that that's just gets drilled into your mind. You select early, 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 early maturities out there. Um, and it, it does pay off in, in, in uh, certain environments like that. Now, you can see very early flowering for R1140, uh, up to th almost three days earlier than, than some of the higher yielding, or the, some of the other commercial lines that are available. It's competitive with the highest yielding lines. Now, these are two lines that have been consistently at the top of the trials, and we have our R1140 is still, is still keeping pace with them, um, along with some of, the, some of the older lines. Scrappy old Agrimax 413 did, did very well this year. Um, so we have competitive grain yield, early, early maturity, and some excellent disease resistance traits. So how many of you grew wheat in 2016? How many of you had stripe rust in your field? Probably almost the same number, right? The same number of hands for both. Um, unless you had very good genetics, right? There are, so that said, there are a lot of genetics for resistance to stripe rust out there. And that was, we had a, an opportunity to collect all that data. Uh, we, we have folks that evaluate our, our genetics in, in Washington state. They have stripe rust all over every single year. And you can see R1140 is very resistant, right? Lower is better for disease, disease traits. So we have a moderate, moderate level of resistance to stripe rust. So rather than looking like something like this here, where your, your, your yield potential just drops like a stone as soon as that stripe rust arrives. And it's, it's, it's a tragedy that, so this is Pioneer 25R46, has some of the best scab resistance out there, but stripe rust is its Achilles heel. So it's a challenge to get everything into one, one single package. Pottery mildew resistance, it's not something that we see every year. Um, shows up early and under the right conditions, it can cause a lot of a yield loss. But we're, snake eyes is a good thing here. So we're, it, we're actually at a zero that does not get powdery mildew. So another, another disease resistance in there that, that, that adds to the, to the insurance there. Now for scab, we, there is a risk for Fusarium here, and, and these are some of the most widely planted, highest yielding lines in the state. We, we do have a vulnerability in, in red wheat still for scab, um, and so it's, it's average to below average for scab. But we, have, we have to look at all these traits. Now there, now, there is, this is another myth busters that I like to bring up, is that um, to have scab resistance means that you're giving up yield potential. That's not always true. So in this figure, I can show you here, this is the average grain yield. This vertical line is the average grain yield in the state. And this line here is the average scab resistance level here in the, in the state performance trial from last year, from 2018. So we're plotting grain yield versus scab resistance here. Of course, in this quadrant right here, you have, you have low real yield. Nobody wants to be in that quadrant. That's low yield, yield potential and highly susceptible to scab, risk for scab, right? Down here we have um, good scab resistance, low FHB risk, but also low potential yield, right? And right here we have, this is, this is the attractive column here, um, where you're looking at high yield potential, but also there's very high risk for scab right here. They're, susceptible, they're high yielding, but susceptible to scab. Right here is the sweet spot, right here. And so you can see there are these, these they're not, this isn't a unicorn, right? You, do, you can find lines with high yield potential and scab resistance right here. High yield and lower risk for FHB. So those do exist. 
Now, because we are, we, because from, from production in the field to actual products in the state of Michigan is important, we have to consider milling and baking. We're not necessarily an export market, but we have to consider our local, our local milling and baking industry here in the state. So, of course, flower yield is important, right? And we see R1140 and 1039 are keeping, keeping pace um, uh, for, with, with their, in terms of their flower yield. And we got to make a good cookie, too. So we're hitting those quality marks within the state of Michigan um, in the soft wheat region as well. OK, so I'll wrap up there. Um, any questions from you guys? Questions or comments? Yes, sir. That's that's a good question, right? There are, yeah, right. Exactly. Who is who's who's the real, <laughs> right? We need to send that one off for testing, right? Um, it it can happen. These are these are rare things where you do get some genetic interactions where there there could be repressions of resistance, and when you cross, they have different suppressors and so on. Um, I, I'm not going to comment too far on that. It does it does happen. Another example. Those of you who are familiar with Ava, they they came out of Ontario. It came from. Um, Highland Seeds in Ontario. That was another case. My, my friend Mark Etchen um, made that cross not expecting to see the high level of scab resistance, but Ava for years was one of the most scab resistant lines in the region. So it, it does happen. And it, you know, that's very keen of you to point that out. Right. Yes, sir. I noticed on your scab on the high, high scab low, yield low risk. Yes. La actually, last year in the state trials, there were eight lines that finished above the mean six at 103% or higher. The carry FHV1. That's and right. I know we're going to hear that later yep. with Dr. Pierce, but I didn't know if you could, Chris Paul, but I didn't know if you could share just a moment what type 2 kind of protection is brought with FHV1 and that that is now available to the growers. That's right. So FHV1 is a gene, and this is a testament to the, the persistence of breeders and geneticists. This came from very exotic material 20 years ago and has been now over time incorporated in some of the highest yielding varieties in the region. So FHB1 is a gene that confers resistance. And I, I showed you those, the, the resistant and susceptible spikes. I'm going to backpedal here to this figure for you guys. Right here. This is FHB1. Right here, W190 has FHB1. And, and type 2 resistance restricts that infection to one or two spikelets. So that, that, spike, that pathogen gets in there, and it gets, it gets walled off. It gets boxed in. Versus those without it, uh, the pathogen moves and spreads. So it, has, it is widely present um, in soft wheat. The Pioneer 25R46 has it. We have it in our program. We're at a point where we're actually crossing elite by elite lines that have FHB1. So there, there, there is no yield penalty associated with it, and it is available. Um, so we, don't, we don't always know which commercial lines have it, because I'm not going to extract DNA from anything that we test, right? I don't have permission for that. But... Talk to, your, talk to your seed salesman, talk to your agronomist, talk to your consultants, ask them does, which lines have FHB1, because they are out there. There was another question. Yes, sir. That's right. So, and I don't want to steal the thunder from my extension pathology colleagues here, but uh, flowering is a critical time. And, and, and so you do have a four-day window. You can, you, can, you can drive by that field a couple times, right, at, after flowering. So you have up to four days for efficacy. For, to, so if your wheat field has flowered, don't throw in the towel yet. You can, you can still spray it late. You can spray it late. Um, and splitting your maturities gives you that ability to cover more ground, but you can also, you can also tolerate uh, a little bit of variability in the weather then as well. Yes, sir. It does tighten up. It will tighten up. So um, it's also very latitude dependent, right? We flower in Michigan from south to north, right? So Huron County is very different from Lenawee County. Um, but at the same latitude, this, this happens in my nurseries at East Lansing, right? And they do tighten up. And when you have uh, stressful high temperature stresses or, or even a little bit of water, uh, moisture stress, they will sink up even tighter. Um, but variety, even though they are late planted, they will flower. They will synchronize. Yes, plus or minus. You saw a variability of about a day there, plus or minus one day on that. Yes, sir. Jerry. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do. I mean, you saw W190. That's that's something that we have breeder seed of. Um, there there are other there are other lines in the program. Yeah, we uh, particularly in the white wheat. Um, we're you know right now we we're building our red wheat germplasm a little bit. The short answer is yes. Is we we we're kind of we're we're kind of um, yeah. I guess the short, I'm just going to leave it with the short answer. Yes, we do have, we, do, we are producing a lot of lines. And so we do see at least one red and one white, white per year. But this year we could have released, potentially released three soft white wheats. Um, but we're, we're building, the, we're building that, so. Yes, sir. The ambassador parent, yes, yes. And I, I've heard that, those comments before. It, the, um, the spike architecture, and and the, the gloom toughness is very mo much more like the ambassador parent. That's right. Yeah, I can I can appreciate that now. That's something we're a little bit more aware of in the breeding program. Looking at the the amount of foreign matter in that in that sample. Absolutely. Okay. It's very good to see you all. I'll be around if you have any other questions later today. It's good seeing you all. Thanks for coming out.